All right. We are live. We are live with the infamous Steve Murray. Seven uh, At the time of this video we're going to watch, you were a 17-time world champion. In 95, you were a 17-time world champion. That's who we're talking to. We're going to get to that in a second, but I also want to introduce Dave Raddick. Who is uh God? Are you the brains of the deal of the Texas State Championship, David? Is that we call yes, one hundred percent, and the zero-time world champion. What? <laughs> what? Come on, that thirty-five and over. Hey, he's a world champion chartologist, the best in the business, baby. David, we got to talk about that. Like uh, thirty-five hundred limited, anything zero. Nope. Uh, runner-up in expert doubles, runner-up in limited doubles, uh, world's fifth in open singles one year. Dude, uh, that's the closest I got. Okay, hold on a second. Expert doubles. Was it called novice doubles? Or was it called yeah, I beat you in that. Remember, remember me dead racing your pole? <laughs> yeah, dude, I hate you. I hate you right now. I hate you right now. Was that 95? Was that 95? Uh, 94, right? I think, or 93. Good Lord. So, Good so Lord. It, should, it should be noted, the year that he took fifth in singles, that's back when the charts mm -hmm. were pretty full. You were talking like 256 players minimum in open singles, some cases 512. So got to give him a little props for that. Dude, yeah. I know. Okay, listen, Steve, I love you, but we got to get back to the reason why I hate him all of a sudden because I didn't know. <laughs> so, real quick on this expert doubles, we played for third place at like 4 a.m. in the morning, right? David, it was like 4 a.m. No, it's right? probably about midnight because we, it was like 14 hours till we got back to the finals. Okay, then you're right. So, what happened? Yeah, I lost. Oh, that was that was for third, and you beat us. And then it was you guys tried to sleep in the room. You guys did sleep in the room. And you guys played the finals like at at seven because we lost her. But who was that? Who'd you lose that final to? Do you remember? Did I lose you guys? Oh, your internet's going. Your internet's going in now. We might get a better. We need a better. Your connection went out. Red went red. Your, yeah, your connection went. But it's perfect now, David. Like I want to. It's gonna do it again. We might want um. We might want to tether you guys or something because your connection is going, going in and out. All right, hey, we're live on Twitch, and we got—I can see their connection uh, going up and down. We're going to try to get them back here in a second, but um, we're promoting the Texas State Championships foosball, and we got Steve Murray and Dave Raddick, and Dave. Uh, Dave just spurred a memory for me. That's uh, a crazy memory. Uh, this memory is playing for third place in an, an expert a novice doubles at the time in '94, and these was a massive full bracket. And uh, back then, the brackets were so full they couldn't keep up. It was, it was double elimination, of course. We played our match, gosh, at midnight uh, in the winner's bracket, and we lost our second match at like 7 a.m. Uh, I was playing with Mike Fermanek and Dave. I can't even remember who Dave's partner was. We're going to try to get them back here in a second as soon as their uh, connection comes back up. Um, here we go. Now we're going to get them back. Hey. Dudes. Dudes. That's going to be on your end. Is it? No way. I, I think so. I think so because right. we never we never lost signal here with uh, with uh, satellite TV. Let me see what's going on here. Let it's so Mark. Okay. No, okay. Check. No, 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 no. You know what? You know what? You made one hundred percent on your side. Traitor. Don't be a traitor here. <laughs> all right, dude. Listen, listen. This is killer. All right. Just can we wrap this up and get to the get to the why everyone it was watching is gonna watch. Who did you play with in the in the novice doubles in '95? Who was that guy? John Young from San Antonio. John Young, man. All right, let's just get past this because this is a brutal memory. Just this losing. We took we ended up taking fifth at that tournament. You guys took second. But hey, you know what? To Steve's point, when you got a bracket of hundreds of teams and you're playing until seven or eight in the morning, that's a pretty damn feel good field. And in the last twenty years, that's a win because what you had to play the extra match or two, right? So you're playing six or seven matches to get to like real teams. You got to play in the winner's bracket, right? It's insane. Yeah. Yep. When the winner did about midnight and lost the finals at noon on Tuesday. Yeah. After, after it was supposed to end Monday night. Yeah. Yep. Those man. were the war of attrition, <laughs> baby. Yeah. Those are those were the days. But you know, uh, we're here to to stop making this about me. We're here to talk about the Texas State Championship, and we got the great Steve Murray. We got the architect Dave. Get back there for a second. How long have you been really behind the? the um, architecture of the tournament? Well, I mean, originally when Texas State started, it was another tornado tournament. And so when they stopped doing it, Steve stepped in and picked it up and uh, pretty much had been involved with him from the beginning. But 
I don't think we start putting our own personalized touches in it to probably maybe about eight, nine years in, you know, before that it was just really kind of just, Hey, let's increase the payouts. Let's build it up. Let's build it up. And now that we, then we built it up, we needed to start making it efficient because, you know, more and more people, same amount of time, you know, you know, with the desire for more events, you know, you needed, you needed to figure out ways to make it special from a, you know, player perspective, you know, make it as seamless as possible. And then also make it special with like the, you know, the perks we do for the masters, you know, the people that have kind of given the most to the game, making them, you know, paying them back for a little bit of their, their stuff. And we did that with the, you know, we were the first ones that did masters, you know, play risk free. We did that master BYP, which started out as an auction and now we've kind of moved it to a, a different format. But again, it's, it's another cash event for, for the masters, but also at the same time, an opportunity for all these lower rank guys to play with guys. They would never get a chance to play with, you know, with real money on the line. I mean, they might draw them in something, but you know, with like, you know, I think it's over a thousand dollars for first. So there, there's a lot of money at stake. You know, high, high intensity, serious matches with the best in the game. So, and you're brushing on it at a superficial level, but I want you to dig deeper because there are a lot of things that make Texas State special. And one big one is the efficiency of it. And you brush upon it, and I think it's critical to kind of talk to people. What makes Texas State run so damn smooth? What is it that you get? Kind of give us the background of it. Give us the the innards of it. Well, I mean, as you move to the package deals, I mean, it just got to the point where everybody was playing everything and we needed a way to not have the conflicts kill it, kill the tournament. So what we started to do is to bracket the event. So, you know, if you're playing rookie singles, then you're not playing pro doubles. If you're playing amateur doubles, you're not, uh, or, well, sorry, it's rookie and expert and amateur and pro. Just trying to box those events up so you don't have all these events starting at the same time with all the same people in it. So. This format lets every event get a good two, two, three hours of runtime before the conflicts kick in because you're always going to have conflicts. But that two to three hours of runtime, you can eliminate half the people. So the people that are still in it, you know, and have to do some waiting, they're at least, you know, in the top half of the field. They're they're actually having a good tournament. They want to stick around. It's not like you play one match, you lose it, you wait six, seven hours, then you lose your second match, and you play two matches, you've done terrible. And you've wasted seven hours of your time waiting on your match to get called. You know, this way you, you get to play, you get to play quickly. And, you know, if you do end up having to be conflicted, it's it's for a reason. It's because you've been in the event long enough. You're doing well enough that it's worth the time. Yeah, the bottom line, the bottom line is when you warm up and you get ready to play, you're going to play for a while before you have to sit. The, uh, the grouping format was the best thing we ever came up with. And when I say we, I mean this guy here. But, uh, you know, at first – Everybody said, you know, you're, you're, you're limiting people from playing every, all the foosball they want to play. But, but what that turned into was the player experience and the overall uh, smoothness of the tournament. It was so much better than, than sitting for hours and going and warm up, wondering when you're going to play. I mean, it was, it was probably the best move we've made since we've been doing it, I think. I think so. Yeah. You know, we're going to get to, Steve, the part of the, uh, part of the substance of the show is getting into playing, yeah. playing some um, matches. I like how you just. So we're gonna play, we're, we're gonna play a match in the background in a minute, and we're gonna talk about some foosball stuff because people want to hear about you as a great champion. We discussed you being a 17-time world champion in '95 when we first when we uh, when when this match we're gonna play was playing. You were a 17-time world champion. We're gonna get to that. We want we want to continue to talk about Texas State for a minute because this is a legacy event, and you know you're you know if if David is the architect of the structure of it. You're definitely the patriarch and the guy who's putting out the resources and kind of ensuring it all runs well. This is your last Texas State. I need you to talk about that a little bit. You talk about the lead up to that and and then and then why and what it means to you. Ah, well, I always stuck to, to what I was good at, and that was the logistics side of it. You know, I knew what it took to get the equipment there and get the room set up right. Uh, everything that went along with that was more my forte. I knew I wasn't ever going to be the guy David is as far as the uh, nuts and bolts of, of running the tournament and being the actual stage director. So, so yeah, I stuck to that. And we, uh, as, as the years went by, we kind of figured out doing it Memorial weekend, that's kind of a family weekend, right? So we, we started incorporating stuff that would be family fun stuff. And, and we would uh, just do extra stuff that would, would allow 
families to come down and enjoy the weekend. But, but yeah, I mean, our goal was when we started, when we first, I think it was 91 when we took over. Anyway, it, it, it just, it was struggling a little bit and we wanted to develop a tournament that the Texas players and really it started with our local guys. We, we just wanted to, we all, all us local guys love to play David, Mike, Soji, Pena, uh, just uh, Charles Britt, just a l- large group of us. We, we love to play. And I thought, man, we, we should run a, a really good Texas state tournament. So that's kind of how it started. And it built from there. And as we, we grew each year, it was organic the whole time. I mean, we started at a $3,000 tournament and, and worked our way up to a, a 30 grand or 25 grand or whatever it is. But uh, the, uh, the focus was give the players a premier event that, you know, I mean, focus on the playing conditions making sure that they would come, they'd be comfortable. They would be uh, playing on, on premium equipment in premium conditions. And we just built from that. And, and uh, that's, that's where we are now. I mean, that's been our forte for, for years is uh, playing conditions and the player experience has been first and foremost in our mind. Why is this your last one? Uh, well, everybody has to step aside at some point, right? I mean, I, I've, I've been, we've been doing it for 32 years and uh, crazy the fact of the matter is I, I'm just don't have the energy. I guess I have the energy, but I want to do some other things. Mm. I, uh, it, it really, it takes, I mean, you could talk to some of the promoters, Mary in particular and some of the others, but, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of resources and, and a lot of energy to run a premium event. And, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've been doing that for a long, long time and, Honestly, it's just I think it's time to step aside and, and uh, I, I don't I have other things going on in my life. You know, I got grandkids and uh, still pretty busy with my job and, and so I still love it and, and it's going to carry on. But but I just honestly, it, it's just time to step aside. I'm tired of doing it. And, and I don't think there's anything I can do to make it any better or any worse. So uh, it's just it's time to move on. Well, look, I hear you t- saying a couple of things. You're saying, yeah, it's going to be your last Texas State, but there's other things you want to do. Those things are probably around foosball somewhere. So I know you're not going to be that far away from foosball. You may have these other things with your family. God bless you. you got grandkids, but hope I could see somewhere in there there's a foosball thing stirring, and I'm excited to see what that evolution is. There, there is. Uh, yeah. there, you and I have talked about that. There's a couple of things that I'd love to do before I completely hang it up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that's in the back of my mind, and if that comes together – I'd love to be a part of it, and and I think that I can bring something to the table to uh, to facilitate uh, a, a premier event in uh, in the in North America. Let's just say North America. All right, doesn't have to be Texas. I'd, I would it'd, it'd have to be a little bit bigger scale. And, I like, yeah, I like, I the, fruity, I like the fruity and slip. Fruity and slip. You said events. There's <laughs> <laughs> an S in there, my friend. I so, love that. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. I, there, there's a couple things that I would certainly, I, I wouldn't hesitate to be involved in, but as far as the year to year with Texas state, we've accomplished a lot, very proud of what we've done. Uh, it's going to carry on. There's going to be some good people to step in and, and carry on the tradition, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's time, brother. It's time. All right. Well, look, the future, um, the future is bright even without Texas State. I know the future is bright with you in foosball. What we're going to get to do now, people are going to play this tournament in like three and a half weeks, man. And you know what people want to do? They want to win. And what you are is one of foosball's greatest winners. I mean, I, I should have looked. I should have done my own research. But we had you. Um, I can't remember where we put you in the top 50 of all time. You're way the hell up there in the top 50 of all time. You're in the top singles of all time. And that's with something we probably won't get too much into. You stop playing foosball. And – Winning is a winning is an interesting property. Uh, winning is an interesting property. I didn't do a ton of winning, and a lot of my dear friends have not done a ton of winning. Winning seems to be um, kept to a narrow group of competitors in any sport. And part of that winning is what's going on between the ears. And so, what we're gonna we're gonna take a, a step back in time, and we're uh, we're gonna let me do this here. <laughs> back in the night. We're back in nineteen ninety five. This is the 1995 Tornado World Championship. I was watching some of this. We're going to get to your match in a second. But on the right is Don Flyter and, and uh, Garrett Schirkenbach. On the left is Sipiora. 
and Evan Statulek. Why those two guys played together? I don't. I don't know why those two guys played together. Um, what, Dave? What do you remember about the '95 World Championships? Uh, a lot, a lot. I I know we got close. We didn't win, but I was, playing, uh, I, I was I believe I was playing with Tommy. Oh, dude, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get and, there. To, and to, uh, to, yeah, that was that was a really great tournament. I mean, we had a a, a ton of players. What I do you remember was, about what, Dave, Dave? David, what do you remember about '95 in foosball? What do you remember? '95 would have been my probably my first year as a pro. Um, so, boy, I yeah, I, I don't know. All, all these guys are the guys that I competed with. You know, you know the Flutter, Schurkenbox, You know, Ron. I played with Ron. Played with Evan before. So yeah, this is to me. This is one of the heyday of foosball. This is when you know you still had the Terry Moore traveling show, going state tournament to state tournament. Um, you know, there was just there were people that were dedicated to this. You know, like not like you see today, where you know you might have. You might have the you know the Tonys of the world that you know really dedicate themselves, or the maybe some of the, the fresh new blood. But back then, there was you know there were 20, 30, you know top guys that did this almost full time. So more than that, more than that, there was a number. There's probably fifty guys that could win on any given day. Yes, it was really competitive. Yes, and I mean, there's guys that you know we don't even talk about anymore that that that. Uh, they could beat any one of us on, on, on the right day. So, yeah, that's what I remember. I remember it being just the fields were so much deeper. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what we attribute that to, but but a 5-12 chart in, in a world championship was pretty routine, you know, and uh, and, and the, the, the level of play and the top 50 to 100 guys was pretty incredible. In fact, there was a lot of, a lot of pros and semi-pros I don't know if we call them semi-pros back then, but novice, novice uh, back then. Yeah, there there was guys that uh, you know if you if you let your guard down, they'd beat you in a hurry. But yeah, uh, so that's yeah, these are good old days. Look 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 at that. You got Sippy and you got Evan wearing matching shirts. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I like that. See that that's uh, we don't see enough of that these days. You know, I really would like to see more of that in in today's game. We see a little bit of it now, and it's starting to come back a little bit, but. But I think that really adds something to it. It adds to the excitement. It adds to the to the event itself. So that's cool stuff. Oh, yeah, it's super cool. And so your match is going to start in a second. And this is some good stuff. Uh, I call this the winning edge. I, I first title of it was winning angry. And then it was winning fury. But I changed it to winning <laughs> edge because I, I, uh, I wanted to lighten it up a little bit. This match is, this match is reflective of 90s foosball to me because – there's a lot going on, Stephen. I want you to reach back in the recesses of your memory and kind of get to that emotional kind of connection to what's going on in this match. Talk to me a little bit about what's happening right now. Ah, listen, I was uh, I, I knew I could play decent goalie, but I was I was riding the coattails of the kid there. That's back when he was really hot. He was playing great. We're playing against uh, two of the premier players on tour. Two of my favorite players. Look at Don; he's got the two hats on, but. But I, I remember those guys had, had besides our shirts, of course, they had kind of the coolest shirts and hats. Uh, me, me and Tommy were looking pretty good too, though. But uh, I, I just remember the uh, the atmosphere and and the vibe, and, and it was just it seemed electric when we were playing this match. Tommy was getting fired up, and I, I was getting fired up. And of course, you know Don Swan, he was always fired up. Dave was the only calm guy on the table. Uh, but yeah, I, I remember this match. I don't remember the, exactly how it went. I just remember it was very close, very competitive, and, and I had a blast playing this match. Well, so the first thing that just happened was Swan hit a push shot, and they screamed in each other's faces. These two guys screaming in each other's faces, and it's almost—I don't know if they've been doing that the whole time. Uh, this is the second game, by the way, and Jim's voice is just so sultry, right? He just, oh, I, I remember back in the day when Dave, Dave and I used to laugh about that. We, the, one of the things we'd look at our partner and just literally get in her face, and we go, "Whoa!" <laughs> but yeah, he, Dave was Dave was good at that, I, and, and and Tommy and I were pretty good at that too. We we did a little bit of a little bit of hollering in that match. So one of the things I like to talk about is managing pressure, and the reason why. I'm not a great foosball champion, and many of my dear friends are not foosball great foosball champions, is because we didn't we didn't uh, find it within our own character or personality to manage those pressure situations. There were more situations where it was match ball, 
that could have got us to the championship level or, or at least to the, the big show. And we didn't manage that pressure properly. Now you have a very distinctive way. And, and, and I love what I love about you is you're not a, a, afraid of your character. Everyone's different, right? And your personality is a fiery personality is an engaged personality It manifests and you, and you made it work for you under pressure. I want you to talk about that in the context of foosball. What, how did you manage stress and pressure in these situations? That's a good question. I, I, I'm not even sure I have the right answer for that. I, I just knew that uh, I knew how to play the game. I knew the mechanics of the game. I knew uh, percentages, right? I knew I understood the percentages and uh, the pressure. I mean, you just you use your timeouts and you and you stay calm and you you, you think through stuff and. You don't do stupid stuff like I just there. I got stuff there with a pull kick. That's that's shit you don't do under pressure, right? <laughs> that's a poor excuse of managing pressure right there. But but no, I just you know what? I never got caught up in that. And in, in fact, the more the pressure, the, the more fun it was for me. And mm. you know, that to me was was the excitement of the game. Uh, you know, playing chess on the table and 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 and. Kick one on one you just kicked the table. You just kicked the table, Steve. That, well, yeah, because I just, <laughs> I, just ate, I ate a miscommunicated, executed pull kick that was garbage there. Yeah, what, I mean, what do you expect me to do? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm going to try to pick up. Non, but. I'm going to try to pick up. David, you know, you know Steve better than I do. You've been close to this man for three decades. I want you to give me your interpretation of how Steve and how he emotionally became – a champion managing his emotions. What's your what's your filter, Dave? Well, I think he just harnesses the energy there because you know with with pressure, you know you can you know it can crush you or it can make a diamond. And mm -hmm. you know I think Steve kind of harnesses it and you know gets it so it's positive. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of pressure in this game, and you there's different different ways to handle it. There's different you know you know scenarios where you can handle it. You know, as a forward, you need to handle pressure a lot differently than a goalie. You know, a goalie—it's a lot easier to be a pressure goalie than I think that is is a uh, a pressure forward because you know you don't have these fine motor skills with playing goalie where you're hovering over a ball, you're you're kicking in the wall, you're you know you're sucking it you know down after nine seconds you know, on a beautiful wall pass. I mean, you're just you're just doing your defense, you're blocking, you're hitting the ball hard, you're getting it out of there. Um, you know, and just you know, kind of the, just being able to do that from the forward position and in singles is is just amazing. And, and you, you can see a lot of people crumble it. You know, we saw that one. You know, I saw that firsthand watching Steve uh, play a, a guy in uh, in the open singles at the finals, I think, at Nationals, where, you know, it was, you know, the guy beat Steve in the, for the winner's bracket. He was an expert at the time, Bill Partridge. And oh. finals started, you know, you know, guy shooting a rollover with a few guys that shot it at the time. Steve blocks the ball, flies up, hits the guy, and Steve just yells, in your face! <laughs> you could just see that, that the pressure just got that guy. He never was the same the whole, whole I remember time. that. I was at that tournament. I remember that. I still feel bad about that. I'm sorry. I'm really getting into this match. I haven't seen this match in so long. I've, you better I've, not be apologizing about yelling in an expert's face. It's so fun playing with Tommy here. That was, that's, this, this brings back really good memories, but yeah, I felt bad about that doing that to Bill, but it was stop. Can you it stop? Was, it was, it was a stop? spur of the moment thing. I, I blocked it and, and it jumped up and hit him in the face, and it just dude. it just blurted out. I, I felt mean, you, felt kind of bad, but once, David's dude, right once, after that. Dude, after that, that, I steamrolled him a little bit. But dude, I remember but Bill's that. Bill's a good player. He was he was a good guy. And a oh, good I love Bill. Bill's great. But once that expert decided to hold, put his hands on the rods. He became your mortal enemy, and that's fine, dude. That's fine. I get, dude. We get you. We get you. This gets really, really. And, and that's that's part of it too, Mark. Yeah. I mean, I, I I wanted to see how I could crawl inside somebody's head and just get them off their game somehow because I didn't have the like the superior tools like like these guys these days. I had a good five bar and I had an adequate shot. It wasn't great, but but where I got them is I I, I would test them a little bit, you know, and I would. Uh, play a little mental chess with him. And, and that's where I think that I, I had a little bit of an edge because I would, I would push as far as I could push and, 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 you know, see, see what kind of reaction I could get. Some guys would react. And if they did, I knew I had them. Some guys wouldn't react, 
you know, and it was probably best that they didn't react because if they did, I knew I pretty much had them. And then you had in the ref aspect of it too, is you're not just playing your opponents, sometimes you're playing the ref as well. And, you know, just like you see the NBA playoffs are on the background here for us. And, you know, working the officials is such a big part of the game there. And, it, and back then it was too. I mean, you know, being able to have them make the calls and, and even just using it to get your opponent out of his game. You know, an opponent doesn't get a call he thinks he should have had. You know, again, it's just another way to, you know, kind of assert your mental uh, dominance over the other team. Yeah, well, I, I, I pressed the refs a little bit. I wanted to make sure they knew what they were doing. And I was going to remind them, if you don't, you better move on. You know, and yeah, that was that was part of my game too. You, just like any sport, right? I mean, you you try to work the rules and everything you can to your advantage. And it, surprisingly enough, I had a kind of a bad rap and everybody thought I was a cheater. But, you know, if, if working the rules to your favor without getting technical fouls called on you, if that makes you a cheater, then by God, I was one. You know, I pushed the rules to the limit, and 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 I had to. That's really the only way I could beat these guys. You're talking about a lot of talented players here. You know, I was that was part of my game, the psychological part of it, and the mental side of the game. And to me, that was a, that was more fun. I mean, I, that made it more fun for me anyway. It was also more entertaining for the crowd too. I mean, look, look, look at look at, look at look at Steve tapping Adrian on the shoulder and working his and working him right there. You see that? <laughs> that wall, that's nice all. small ref. Oh, dude. Okay, look. If you are not, if you did not know '90s foosball, and you're seeing this match for the first time, you're going to get a full view of what '90 foosball is all about. They're talking to Adrian. No, you got, you got the Dave Council there. You got Dave Council on one end. Adrian was having nothing of it. I used to, I used to try to work Adrian a little bit, but he would have nothing of it. And uh, we got close to it a couple times. He almost teed me up a few times. I know Council teed me up a few times, and probably a couple of them were unjustified. They were just totally bad calls, but he can't help it. He was trying to do his best. But, but yeah, that's, that's funny you noticed that. I was patting the ref on the back. Good, good job, ref. Way to go, man. Good call. I was playing Stephen. <laughs> I was playing Steve in the finals of an open singles, a city championship here, and we got a ref, and it was Dennis Ory. He was a, was a pro player that you know probably most of your listeners know. He's one of the, you know, the better pros on tour. Uh, he just got a call, by the way. Yeah. I want you to finish your story, David. They just got a call, a jar call. David, please finish your story. <laughs> well, Dennis called a technical on Steve. I think it was for cursing or just something no, pretty, no, no, pretty no. arbitrary. I never cursed. I never cursed. <laughs> and, and Steve just looks at him and goes, are you sure you want to make that call? And Dennis just kind of sat there for about 60 seconds, and he's like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to make that call. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and Dennis, had, Dennis has never gone back on another call for the rest of his refing career. Yeah. It, was, it was a learning moment. <laughs> Teach him I, a moment. I turned Dennis into one of the best refs on tour. Oh, my gosh. He's, he, and he is. He's and very, he he's a very good that, official. He will, he will credit Steve with that, too. I mean, he, Steve taught him a lot about refing. Yeah. Look, at, look at this. Look at the screen. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was a little fiery right there. I wish we had some audio on that. I know I had something to say there. If this table was mic'd right now, we'd have a a, a psychological um, a set, a understanding of of winning foosball. This type so of that's the thing, man. That 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 was that's what's missing, in my opinion. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. we didn't. Even, I wish we had the the, uh, the inside foos setups back then that we have now. It would have made it. It would have been. You know, I had some good memories. I would have had some good archives to look at one of these days but but yeah i mean that's that was part of the the fun is letting the personalities come out a little bit within reason you know you don't get personal and and ugly and just out of control but let the personalities come out a little bit you know make it a little more exciting that's why horton was so fun to watch right i mean you just you came, you came off. You, 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 you came two feet off the ground. You came two feet off the ground, jumping on the jumping up the table. I don't know if you. I don't know if you saw that. I missed that. See, I'm having a tough time concentrating, talking to you and watching this. This is fun. I haven't, I haven't seen this match in. Oh my god! I need to go back one second, but not too far, because I need you to see. Let's see. I don't know if I missed it. I want. Let's see. So I want. I want to get back to that moment where you jump into the air. Um, it was. It was. It's. It's. God, so indicative of, of emoting and engaging and connecting to the sport in a, and um, we we are missing it. I mean, Steve, you you were talking to you were talking about how the sport's missing it, you know, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's starting to pick up a little bit now, but but 
got to let these guys' personalities come out, man. I mean, look, did you see Swan right there? I mean, that, they, they almost kissed. They, they, they almost they kissed. They I, I think I went, I went back a little too far, but we'll just we'll just watch it from here on. And you're and, and this is a, that you respond to that. You you guys are now in a match. It's just the four of you and everyone else is at, besides the judges. It's just the four of you in a in a fight right now. You guys are in a brawl right now. Yeah, this was fun. This was good stuff. Uh, I think what you were saying earlier about so many people more the brackets being deeper, it's reflective in the history where there was like seventeen different world championships up uh, w- world champions in singles. So I think that's the number up until like ninety eight, and then there's only like four or five guys that start winning everything. So different people won open singles every single year for forever, including like the Gummison win in like 94. Right. I mean, it just came out of nowhere. Right. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then we get to a point where there's less players and you lose a less. You have less of everything. You have less um, personality. You have less character. You have less of everything. I, and that's why this memory is so great. Now here, let's see what happens here. Let's well, see, what do we got? We got what three to three? Three to three, probably in the fourth or fifth game. It looks like three to three. My vision is at least as bad as yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the glasses on, buddy. I can't see without them. I don't think it's the fifth game. Oh, now we're going poll. Yeah. Nope. No, nope. good block. Yeah. Um the cowboys gear. Was that of course that was pre-planned? Did you buy that stuff for Tommy? Uh, hand it on hand and i thought it was a good idea and yeah i bought the extra shirt and, and had the hats and i thought man that'd be kind of cool you know and and again i i like that stuff uh you you look at swan and gummison they look that those are the coolest shirts and the coolest hats uh okay steve did you think that at the time <laughs> it look cool actually, now. I actually did. I actually yeah. did. I, 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 really, I think I even complimented Dave on on the cool shirts, but but uh, yeah, no, the, the the team spirit. I thought it was very cool. I'm, I'm waiting for me to jump up in the air here. Yeah, yeah, I went back too far. Uh, so this was this episode. I I, could, I was debating what to call it. I was I called it um, like winning fury and. Winning with anger. Oh, hold on, let's see what happens there. I think this is the one before the one. Oh, there it was. <laughs> yeah. You're just, it's, it's, it's really, really good. But Steve, my take on you, and I leave myself open to be wrong because I'm not in your head. Uh, you controlled all the variables. Now, I think you're undermining to a, a certain extent. Let's see the response. If he scores this, we got to see the response. I don't know if you get the block or not. Okay, missed it. Um, you undermine your own skill. You say, oh, I wasn't as skilled as these guys. You know, frankly, at, at that level, you're a left-handed player. You got the ball every time. Your five-bar defense, you'd race people to the wall. Your pull shot, you couldn't really tell you were, you were a lefty because you put your pull shot. You, you hit the ball really, really well. So you were at least equivalent skill and, and exceeded skill in most places. But still, that doesn't make you a winner. Because in, in the – there it is. It's over. Wow, man! See, that's just that's just grit and I'm fire. I yeah, you know, I, I I was I was a pretty disciplined player too, though. I think uh, honestly, I I valued every possession because I know I didn't have the pull shot like a Todd Lafredo or a John Smith or a Kevin Keeter or all those guys. So I had to uh, I had to be fairly smart with with my possessions, and I think that might have been the difference. And I had I kind of had an ability too, of of playing a little chess with, with my possessions from the three bar. If that makes sense, I, I, I might send a message with some straights or, or a couple mills or something to open something up or try along or something, knowing that when, when I really needed it, I knew there was going to be a straight or a middle there and I'd save it and, and try to set it up at some point. So, so that was fun for me too, to, to, to kind of work my possessions to where I knew uh, when I really needed the point, there was going to be something there I could execute. I'm going to ask you about that because notoriously, and I want to separate fact from fiction or what the what people said about your game versus what was true. Uh, your reputation was, your inside game was amazing, and you could get a long out there every time you needed one. That the, your that your long was your weakness, but you had a straight that would just you just would you had the patience, you know, of a panther 
waiting for that thing to go straight. And your inside game was incredible. You you get a long out there if you needed one to do so. Is that was that right? Was that your your game? No, that's pretty accurate. I mean, uh, never had the overwhelming long like everybody, and I I had probably at least six variations of a straight, and I could hit a square middle, slider middle, uh, you know, angle middle. Look, you leave me the, the short holes, and I'm going to get them. And so, yeah, and I had to, I practiced that a lot because I knew I didn't have the uh, the overpowering long. I could spray one out there every now and again to keep them honest, right? And I would do that. And occasionally guys would sit inside tight and, and I'd hit some longs. But for the most part, I would uh, I would shoot a couple longs and work the inside inside out, right? I mean, and, and if you had – I had four or five different types of straight ends. So, yeah, I, I remember winning tournaments on, on hitting straights. Yeah, coming up when Steve was, you know, giving feedback on our games when we were just beginning, you know, you know, you see everyone practicing sort of long, they always throw the dead man out there. And he's like, you know, just put your pinky between the bumper and the wall, and you will never have to shoot longer than that. And <laughs> you know, just from you know, spraying the ball if it's a if it's standard or just timing it to get around a reverse, you, you don't need to hit the these dead man shots. And his spray long was, you know, it was a spray. You, you don't it, you know, it gets out there, it's fast enough and you know, one of the shots that he did that, you know, I still try to do that I learned from him was, you know, that brush through on a on a reverse defense where you're just that deep angle. You're not even really putting the ball. You're just brushing it across the goal. That will just screw some defenses up. And it, it's, you yeah. know, it's one of those things. It opens up everything for you. It'll it'll pucker up the you know what. I mean, it'll pick it up. <laughs> you know, you're right. you that little slider and uh, – just hit a couple of those things out there, and, and David's right. That's exactly I, – I, I practiced the two-finger long on a, on a reverse defense, and if I could hit that long fairly consistently, that was really all I needed because I knew it would open up some other holes. And, uh, you know, then it's all about knowing how to read a defense and, and get your timing together. And it wasn't always perfect. I mean, but, boy, when you got in a groove, and you could just pretty much hit anything you wanted. And, and man, I just – I loved getting in the groove and, and – Picking a goalie apart was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, there's so many different holes to hit on a full shot, and he hits them all. That's one of the nice things about a shot was, you're right, he doesn't have this big cannon of a square long, but he could hit the square splits, he could hit the spray splits. So it doesn't matter if you're in the standard or the reverse, he can hit the split on it. Where you see a lot of these guys, they have a nice, you know, square, tuck back shot, but, you know, they can't spray behind the two rod because they just, that motion isn't there, that strike of the ball is in there and he had both you know the square and the angle so there's just so many different holes to hit on a full shot you know compared and you, you've seen that with the evolution of the rollover too before when the rollover first started yeah. long, long. and very simple shot is simple, but when people started catching on to that you know the, the percentages plummeted and now right. you see how it evolved with the moving the tapping the inside shots you know the offsets you know it just you know it, it kind of almost tried to create a pull shot you know mentality of it where there you have you know, six or seven different options as opposed to just power and speed, you know, hitting the three. Yeah. Ter Terry Moore was, he worked that shot as good as anybody I ever saw. And then, and then of course, Tony came along and, and, and took that thing to a whole new level uh, going back and forth and, and working some insides and stuff like that. He's, he's the, there's, a, there's a handful of players. I think that, that really, they have that ability where they can do the walking snake and, and work some middles, work some some cutbacks, and yeah, it's pretty impressive, actually. You know, I want to get back to this this uh, other part though, where I'm a big proponent of people. They can emulate other people, but if they try to be other people, it doesn't work for them. Like I mean, I used to try to uh, not emulate, but like simulate Tom Spear, and never worked for me. You know, again, the whole stoic thing didn't work for me, and. And it just try, but there's emulation and there's being who you are and, and understanding who you are and then winning, winning with, with who you are. And and when I would watch you play, which was a lot, man, I'd watch you play a lot. Uh, you had you had dominion over the sphere around your table. You were in control of everyone within 30 feet of the table. Like the people watching you, heaven forbid, the people rooting against you, they knew that they were part of the match. If someone was rooting against you. They, they were part of the match, and you made them a part of the match. As a matter of fact, you engaged them. You made eye contact and engaged them. And for me, what I saw, and I'll leave myself open to be wrong. I want you to correct me. 
what I saw was um, you controlling the variables and, and, and sure, making sure that no one in that circle knew you were going to back down from any competitive threat. Like it was all competition. The, the whole area around the table was competition. And if you were rooting for the other guy, you were on the other team. In the spirit of competition, it wasn't like you were going to beat anybody's ass, but you were absolutely competing with everybody who was you, – you, anyone you identified a threat – and you and you you will you put that it motivated you it gave you energy it made you fight harder it, was that real absolutely 100 percent. i fed off the energy of of the surroundings you know i honestly and i needed that mark i i needed to to draw that energy from the crowd and and find ways to motivate myself yeah. because that's really i couldn't i couldn't play quiet and calm and stuff i wasn't I wasn't really good like that. I mean, I, I could not reach a level of execution to, to beat the better players when I was trying to be nice, smooth, and calm and stuff. I needed to get up. I needed to find a way to, to feed off some energy. And sometimes I even had to, uh, I'd have to find a reason to get pissed off. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, seriously. But, but no, I, I would feel the energy from the crowd. I, I fed off that, in, in fact. But there was it was no, no more fun than you had a group of people rooting for your opponent, and then you had a group of people yeah. rooting for you, and then you that all that energy together around the table. There's nothing like it, and I fed off that, and I think the better players do. I mean, I, I think they all. That's that's why we play. We want to feel that energy. We want to feel that vibe. So yeah, absolutely. That's uh, I've, I fed off that almost every tournament. Yeah, increases the stakes too. I mean, you get more people engaged. There's more. There's more at stake, and it helps you focus. You know, you talked about never throwing any shots away and just treating every ball, you know, as, as the uh, most important. When it doesn't feel like there's a lot at stake, it's real easy to, you know, do something stupid. Oh, the ball landed here. I'll. Oh, it, it's a good pot for a lane pass. I'll just do a lane pass. You know, it's just kind of just going through the motions. And when you put, you know, the stakes on the line, and it, it just makes magnifies every ball and to his point he you know that's where he excelled and other people that you know they didn't and so if he can create a situation where he's excelling and the opponent is not in an optimal space then yeah it's great something you said steve it reminds me of tony because tony does the same thing in, like i said by the time this tournament is happening in 95 you're already a 17 time world champion tony has won so much stuff that he has to look for those things to fire him up, to get him motivated, to get him engaged. Same kind of thing. Yeah. I've been at the top of the mountain. I got to find that thing that's going to put me over the edge emotionally to beat you. And what? I think, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, which, which makes him amazing. I mean, yeah. it, the, the guy never loses a singles tournament. And yeah. I don't know if people realize how hard it is to get up every time you play, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In every sport, yeah, you have an off day. Well, he – he hadn't had an off day in 25 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's uh, that's incredible how he he manages to get himself jacked up for every singles tournament. It's uh, that's uh, pretty incredible, really. Yeah, but I think it's great. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, Dave. Sure. Uh, just help some people like Sandra Trish. You got the Steves and the Tonys of the world. You got Federico. I mean, I remember one year Worlds, huge chart. He gets he gets upset like first or second. I think it's second round by Eric Dunn of Pro mm -hmm. Canada. That guy came back in one, I think it was seven match balls, two out of three matches to get back into, into wow. the you know, yeah. Seven match balls. I mean, in, in two out of three. I mean, just that's great. That's like a coin flip. Yeah. Do it seven times in a row is, you know, it's just amazing. It's exhausting. Yeah. Just thinking yeah. about it, I'm exhausted. <laughs> the beautiful thing about this match is we have four champions and each a little bit different. So Lewis Cartwright, one of the most uh, brilliant 90s tornadoes, tornado champions. And his whole thing was, I'm going to do the smart thing every time on the pressure ball. And I'm just going to focus on what's in front of me, which is not too dissimilar from everyone else in a way, but he had his own mental thing. Adrian was situationally great. He had the, he, he had it like Adrian won a handful of things, but the handful of things were amazing, right? He beat Frederico in the finals of open singles of a major. He has an open doubles world championship. He's got some, he's got some sporadic stuff. He has more second and third place positions than first, but yeah, his share of first place finishes. And he had to find that he had to put it all together at the same time. Cause he had his weaknesses in his game. And then the other side, you got Scotty who's some kind of weird hybrid Lafredo spear protege. And then you got Lafredo. 
And these are on Lafredo's. I think Lafredo's way different than you, Steve. I mean, the way Lafredo won and the way you won, I think was wildly different. I don't know. You know, gosh, you know Lafredo. Tell me what Lafredo's mental strategy was. How did he manage pressure? You know? No, I don't think he felt any, really. I, I, I played with him before. I, we won a world title in 87. Mm -hmm. uh, he did some stuff that I don't know why and how he would ever attempt it in pressure situations, but that's that was his game. <laughs> he was absolutely <laughs> fearless no matter what. There you go. The lovely Gina Murray has come in to, to, to refresh our beers, I think. Oh. <laughs> I love the beer me. Wow. <laughs> so, so anyway, Lafredo, Lafredo is he's a machine number one. I mean, his he's his uh, physical ability on the table is, is second to none, and he's done it for forty some years. But when I played with him, I I, I don't think he I don't think he feels pressure. I, I, I to this day I don't think he feels pressure. And I think that's how he deals with pressure. He doesn't allow himself to feel it. And I know that sounds goofy, but, oh, okay. it makes but sense. I, I don't think he, you know, I mean, he knows how important a possession is. He does. He, he understands that. And believe me, if it's two to one or, or one to one in the fifth or whatever the case might be, when you need to score that key ball, he understands that, but, but he's fearless. And I don't think, I just don't think the guy feels pressure and that's what's made him the player he is. And, uh, for someone to play at his level for as long as he has, it's just, it's, it's unheard of. I mean, his pull shot today is as good as it was back when we won in 87. It's, it's ridiculous, but, but yeah, he's, he's a weird animal. I mean, I'll tell no you his pull shots, a thing of beauty. And this is prime Lafredo. And we're not going to rewind it. Cause last time I rewinded it like three minutes too far, but his pull shot, he's taking his jacket off after he won the game, which is, that means they're going to win the match. If he's taking his jacket off, that means the match is over back in 95. His pull shot is just lightning. The new kids don't have an appreciation for how awesome this guy's game was. They just, they, it, it's funny. They, they see the, he's in his he's 60 now, right? But yeah. the, guy's, the guy's physical ability in 95 is um, unparalleled. His pull shot is lightning fast, lateral speed, invisible takeoff. You'll see things he does here. Like he sets the ball up and he's stoic. He sits still. He has no tells. And he just blasts the ball, and it disappears. You know. Oh, I know. I know. I played behind him before. It, it, his, his shot's incredible. Yeah. And when he won, uh, I think he won with Weidman one year, and he was playing against. I think it was Spear and, and Bowers, hmm. and it may not have been the finals, but it was close to the finals. They were playing for the winner, the loser, or something. And, and and Todd w had been fasting for for like four days. Yeah, uh, hadn't had anything to eat. And I watched him play this match against those guys. And Bowers' defense was fast, but he was trying to do a race defense, a standard race on Todd. And I've never seen anybody hit a faster long spray pull shot ever. It was the most incredible thing. But but again, I mean, he's he just his his. Ability to recognize what he needs to do in in a like in a hurry. I mean, he can look at the defense, and if you're leaving something, he's going to hit it. He doesn't he doesn't screw around, and he executes it to perfection. So, yeah. I mean, he's seen every defense out there. You know, he sees a certain yeah. pattern. He recognizes. He knows exactly what to do by nature. He doesn't have to think about it. Yeah. This team is one of the greatest teams from the '90s. There's the winning they did at the Worlds, and then there's the winning they did at all the tour events every year leading up to the worlds and they just would win everything. And, and at some point, Terry and Bobby um, start taking over, but in the interim time, it was, uh, this was the team to beat on the right, Scotty Weideman and Tal Scotty Weideman and Tyler Fredo. Uh, as we get to the tail end of our promotion here, um, you know, you're going to have look a lot of look at Lou here is pretty disciplined in this match too, buddy. He's great, man. Lou's Cartwright is, people stop playing foosball for one reason or another. And oftentimes it was just the, the commitment to it, the amount it took to stay at the top and, and then the money. Right. But lose one of those guys that when he was, when he was focused on foosball, he still comes out and beats the top pros out there. He's still like yeah. one of the, when he, you know, still one of the best players out there when he plays, he, he's not in a position right now to win because uh, he, he never practices, but you see the mental edge is still there. Foosball's yeah, unique. 
Very disciplined player. Very yep. disciplined. Foosball is a unique sport where most sports, people uh, decline over age, and then a new generation comes up and starts beating them with regularity and frequency, and then those people retire. Foosball is unique because most of the top foosers stop playing when they're at their peak physical ability. They just don't play anymore. Um, you get very few that continue to play, so you, yeah. you miss a lot of this going on. But, hey, Steve, I want to ask you, and, and Dave, I want to ask you too, you're going to have some young players see this. Uh, young players, um, experts, amateurs, rookies that have never won anything. And they're going to come to the Texas State Championship, and they're going to uh, have an opportunity to advance to the next round or get to a final. And, and so, David, outside of practicing and outside of, you know, the things you do, the, the, the mechanics and the things you work on and having three shots that, that, are, that look the same, that go to different holes, what, what, how do you have, tell those people to prepare? How do you have them prepare for this game mentally to win big, big matches? You know, I think a lot of that has to do with what you said, and it's not because of having those skills, it's believing you have those skills, because mm. once you start losing belief in, this in yourself, or second guessing, or limiting yourself to what you're going to do because of what you feel you can execute at the time, um, that's where your game just falls apart. And, you know, and, and being someone who, you know, I was never a, a Steve, but I was, a, you know, a pretty, a pretty good player in my Dave day. Dave is a great player. But when you lose that confidence, when you lose that, that faith and that you can do your options and you're instead of letting you know you picking what you're doing as opposed to trying to fit what your physical abilities let you do that's that's the big thing and that that confidence you need to have that confidence you need to have that belief in yourself because once you lose that you're, you're just not going to win i mean period steve your yeah. turn man you i need you to coach some of these young players that are coming your tournament for a chance to win their first major championship and let's not forget the texas state championship a size, legacy, history. It is a major event in foosball. Maybe the premier event at this point. Players Championship, and this is a coveted title as any out there. Uh, I would just tell the kid, look, you know what has gotten you to the certain point, right? And you got to be yourself. Don't try to be someone else. Uh, you know, it's, it sounds very cliche, but you stick with the stuff that got you there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you try to play within yourself. I mean, Old school folks, they used to read The Inner Game of Tennis. It's a pretty mm -hmm. good book. Yeah. And it really, it kind of explains how all that works in pressure situations and how you uh, control your emotions and, and stay within yourself and you don't try to do stuff that's out of character. But David nailed it. You, you, you know, stay within yourself. Do the things that you did to get there. And don't try to be cute. Don't, you know, don't try to be super cool. Just... Don't and don't be ashamed to pop a couple straights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in there, baby. I want a couple tournaments on some straight in. So, That's yeah, funny. Work your options. Play smart. Uh, uh, cherish every possession. Be smart with your possessions. Play with heart. Be play. Play with composure. Uh, but but play to win. Don't play to lose. Play to win. Yeah, I'm sure Steve wasn't the first person to say this, but one of the things that he always said was practice like you play and play like you practice. You know, you see a lot of these kids and you see them, you know, practicing slingshots and aerials and, you know, all this, you know, cool looking funsy stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, brush pass, pull, pull shot, stick pass, roll over. You, you stick to the basics and you, that's what you practice so that when you are playing, you have that confidence you know, that you can execute under pressure. And if you have that confidence, you will execute and you'll, you'll be a winner. That's right. Y'all, I'm going to say something that before we sign off here, something I learned from you, Steve, uh, when I was trying to be Tom Spear and I was trying so hard to not emote or do anything and it was failing me. And the thing I learned from you is this, who are you? What is your nature? If your nature, if you're a Zen person, you know, whatever you're Buddhist, maybe the Tom Spear thing is for you. But if you're a little angry like most of us, and you got a little thing that, you know, with a little edge to you, uh, you got to embrace that. And you got to understand yourself in competition that way. You got to make that work for you. Don't hide from that. You guys are saying the same thing. I'm just saying it a little differently. Don't hide from you who you are. Because if you could find who you are while you're competing and manifest that, uh, and it, it, it'll help you compose yourself. Because you're you're organic to the moment to yourself, and man, uh, man, brother. Hey, man, man, so, well said. Uh, listen, don't man, ever, don't ever be afraid to be yourself. 
Yeah. Well, so, be yourself. Uh, the, the, the truth will set you free. It'll make you play better. Awesome. <laughs> well said, brother. Beautiful. Well, listen, man, it, it's been an incredible show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We are promoting the Texas State Championship. It is at the end of May here, Memorial Day weekend. It is, um, it's at the Marriott, right? That's which Marriott is that, Steve? I'm forgetting the name of it. it is the DFW Airport Marriott, yep. right there on the north end of um, is very, very convenient. I mean, literally less than five minutes from you, you hit the ground on your flight and you're at the hotel within five minutes. It's very convenient. It's a beautiful hotel. We've uh, got a lot more space than we had last year. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful setup. We're, we're excited about some of the new stuff we're going to do and look forward to seeing everybody there. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think between your term, I mean, the only tournament, the tournament that impresses me, that's inviting of families that's safe and comfortable and efficient and well-run a, a true professional promotion. It's, it's a tournament I immediately think of. So I'm looking forward. I'm going to be at the Texas state championships inside Foo's going to be at the Texas state championships, Jim and me, the crazy duo we're gonna jim keeps me in line i make him laugh inside who's going to be there covering this tournament we are uh, excited to be at the tech state championships you got to be at the tech state championships get your play ticket get your uh get your hotel room and, and let's party in texas state yeah uh, that's it for this time pandemonium episode one the winning edge thank you steve thank you david we're signing off thanks, thanks Mark. Appreciate, appreciate it look forward to seeing you buddy all the best <laughs>